And that, as I said, if the Lord is an infinite, and He is, and He's glorious, and He is, then He is infinitely worthy of glory. Right? Do you understand the concept? That we could never, never give Him enough glory. No matter how much we do, no matter what we do with our life, we can never glorify the Lord enough. He's infinitely greater than we are. Yes? I'm going to try to ask this question. Okay. <laughs> Would it be true to say that all things that happen, good or bad, happen to glorify God? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely right. And that goes back, I, I said this on the beach in a different context, but God receives hell, uh, receives glory through people being in hell. They voluntarily chose to go there. They are sinners. They didn't acknowledge God in any way, shape, or form. And He will receive glory. He receives glory actively through the people in heaven that are praising Him for eternity. He receives it passively through the people that actively chose not to accept Him. You see the difference? He is going to receive His glory one way or another. It doesn't mean that it's a great thing that happened to Him, but He is being glorified through what happened. They are passively bringing Him glory. That's just the way it is. So in all things, everything that happens from the moment of creation all the way to the end of eternity is meant to bring glory to God. As I said, um, the number one article of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Has anybody ever read that? It's very long and it's got like, you've read it? Article, 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 article. Do you know how the old the guy was that wrote that? He's like 23 years old. And it is, one of, it is a masterpiece of understanding the nature of God and our relationship with Him. It's, it, Reformed theologians use it all the time. They, they cite it almost as the Bible itself. It's called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And the very first question, it's based on questions and then answers to those questions. The first question is, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God. That's it. And I couldn't think of a more appropriate first question and answer by a young guy. I mean, just some guy that just, there it is, Westminster Shorter Catechism. In other words, you have the long catechism. It's just a shorter version of it. And that's the one that people use. But the Westminster Shorter Catechism, just type it into your scroll bar. You're going to get a million of them from every Reformed website that's out there. And after about 20 or 30 articles, you're just going to be like, I can't read anymore. Because I mean, it goes on and on. And it, it has all these beautiful, valid points about our relationship with God, the nature of the Bible. You know, I've never read the whole thing just because... You know, I mean, it's just like reading the Proverbs. You can only read so many Proverbs in a row without them just kind of jumbling up in your head. At least I can't. I don't know about anybody else, but I can't. Proverbs is the hardest book in the Bible for me to read. Not because of the content, but because of the structure. I just, you, you, you know, you just can't retain all these little quips of information. It's like I got some people, they're very annoying on Facebook, and they type... <laughs> Quips all day long. One, they just cut and paste quips. You know, blah blah blah, blah blah blah, and all day. And you know, it's nice, but after about ten of them, you just can't retain them anymore. And so I make up my own little quotes every single day now, and I post one on the internet a day. And you know, question. what? I'm just your survey question. Yeah, you know, I just I, after a while, it kind of degraded where people started getting angry at each other, and I thought I don't want to do this anymore. I really miss doing that, and you don't. No, but I used to do something even before that called what is this and I take a photo of some unusual thing every day like the inside of a toaster and I'd say what is this and I would get I'd have people waiting at the end of the day when are you gonna post this when are you gonna post this and I have just all kind go back on my photo album for what is this the first one I did I took a picture of a manatee's nose sticking out of the water and I thought you know, I'm going to post it. And I thought, oh, I got some. I put, what is this? And it's your dog's butt while he's diving down in the water. And it's a five-gallon bucket. And I got answer, answer. And I thought, this is really fun. So I started, here's, the, I got to divert. This is so funny what happened. I'm looking for things to, what I do is I take the photo and I crop it so that you only get a piece of it. But it's something you can. Once I tell you, they go, oh, yeah. But I'm at the, I'm wearing fatigues, my army fatigues. I'm at the uh, airport, Sarasota Square, uh, Sarasota Inter uh, whatever airport, and uh, I'm waiting for my son, and I'm there taking photos. And the security police came up, and they interviewed me. They got all of my information for terrorism. I mean, I look, you know, I got this beard, I've got this hair all over, and a bandana, and and 
finally I said, well, here, just take my camera. And he's, what, what is this? And I said, and I told him, I said, I, he said, a game. We, we wasted all of our time on a game. <laughs> it's not a game. I said, people really enjoy this. Why did you stop? It sounds like a great thing. It was, but after a while, I just stopped thinking of things that I could take a photo of because you really have to get out into malls and I don't go out a lot. You know, I'm just not one to go out. So, but go back and look at some of the old photos and don't look at what it is or the answer at the bottom, but just look at it and just, I wonder what that is. You know, like a, a, a banister going up the side of, uh, you know, at the airport or a row of chairs at the airport and they're all glowing, but all you see is the glow of each end of a chair. And as soon as you know what it is, and now I've told you, so you're going to know, but as soon as you know what it is, but I did this for months. People would beg for me to post it. Why don't you have one today? You know, and then I got into the, uh, the other one that you said, the, oh, the survey question of the day. You know, what do you think about abortion? What do you think about this? And, you know, and then I always gave the correct answer is, which really upset people. Yeah. You know, that's okay. But uh, now I'm doing quotes like uh, today's will be, I said it yesterday, today's quote is, um, uh, if the church replaced Israel, God made a big mistake in 1948. You know, or here's yeah. one that's coming up in a couple days. It's um, better to be a worm in God's creation than evolution's helpless child. So, you know, just try to think a little, yeah, you know, I, every day I'm posting one and it's kind of making, it's giving me something to do with my life. Sometimes, usually though I found with a single quote, people just ignore it if they don't agree. But one of them, I had 70 likes on one of my quotes. I don't remember which one it was, but 70. You know, uh, one of them that's coming up is, um, uh, what is it? Easier to find the end of eternity than to come to the end of God's love. Woo! Anyway, so try, trying to think of these every day, and it's not easy. It is very hard to think of a, a quote that makes sense. Uh, here's one that I was looking at my fan and I said, like the swirling blades of a fan is the, uh, is the fool with his paycheck. So anyway, <laughs> whatever, just something to do. And I, I'm posting them one at a day. So, and what I'm doing, if you look at the, uh, the devotional I send out, I, do you get the, the one that I send out by email, I'm putting one of those quotes on my title page. You know when I send it out, have a nice day? Under that, I'm putting my quote. I've done it for three or four days. So go back and you can read the last three or four days. Anyway. Just something to do. Um, wherever we were, I don't know, five, seven, I five? Did, yeah. Okay. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. Okay, just as a point, what book of the Bible says, and they shall know that I am the Lord, then they shall know that I am the Lord, it says it, I think, more than any other book in the Bible, and it says it again and again and again and again. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel. Speaking of the rebellious Israelites. So it's like a contrast of their redemption right here. They are being exiled. They're being punished. And here's the contrast. That's, I think that's why the Lord does that. Is, is Then they shall know that I am the Lord when I bring them out of Egypt. And Egypt will know it. Well, guess what? They had to learn the same lesson. Oh, and having spoken of Proverbs being a hard book to read, the other part of the Bible, the only other part that I find very difficult to read is the last, I think it's eight chapters of Ezekiel from 40 to 48, where it's speaking of the rebuilding of the temple. And, it, it, you know, because it's, it's just very hard for me to read. But other than that, those are the only two parts of the Bible that it's, I don't want to use the word tedious because no part of the Bible is tedious, but it's very mentally exhausting to try to pull in all that information at one time. So, Okay, go ahead. Six, please. So Moses and Aaron did it. As the Lord commanded them, thus they did. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Okay, so Moses was 80 years old. And if you'll notice this, and probably you've heard this in a sermon. If you haven't, it's kind of interesting. His life is divided into three 40-year sections. 40 years, he went off to Egypt. 80 years, he comes back and he delivers them. 120 years, he kicks off. A man with, without dim eyes and still full of vigor. Okay? And this particular verse shows you something about divine election. What does it show you? The one we just read. The, the, the second one. Second replaced the first. Moses is younger than Aaron. Right? You get that from this verse. So once again, the second is replacing the first. But... Aaron is the high priest. Moses is the redeemer. Okay? So, but as I said, you know, you have, you've got these parallels. The, the uh, uh, 
anyway, it's divine election. Moses was chosen first, and then just because he's the high priest, I mean, you can't have an exact parallel all the way through the Bible, because if you do, then you have exactly what you're looking for. But that just shows you the second is replacing the first in the particular instance that he is the great redeemer. Okay? All right. And plus, it also shows that Moses, despite being the great redeemer, was not chosen as the high priest. And so, in other words, God is... They, and you're going to see this later. God is choosing Aaron as the high priest rather than Moses so that they can't say in the wilderness that Moses has grabbed all of the power for himself. Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, he is the leader, but he's not the high priest. It's somebody else gets that designation. It's kind of like, and I don't want to make a, a perfect example, but this just popped into my head. You've got God the Father, God the Son. You've got different... Uh, uh, things that different entities are doing, okay? Moses does this, Aaron does that, but he's not a big power grabber and they can't accuse him of that because his brother is doing a duty that he's not. And then the Levites are the ones that rebel, right? Remember the Levites? We're going to get to it. We're not there yet, but they rebel when in fact they were the chosen ones of the tribes of Israel. So it shows you the perverse nature of even being favored, well, I want to be the high priest, or I want this, or I want that, when God has already given them a special blessing above the other brothers of Israel. So the, it just this whole account is showing us the perverse nature of us as individuals. And yes. like last night, Jonah, I mean, what a pity party this guy had. <laughs> she heard this, but if you ever just want to see something that is incredible, Read Jonah chapter 4 and just look at how selfish that guy is. Yeah. Unbelievable. What a pitiful, full of animosity. He's just like us. And that's, that was the whole point of last night's sermon. We are yeah. just like this guy. Yeah. And I gave example after example of Charlie Garrett being just like Jonah. You know, just, just like him. Okay, go ahead, please. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you saying, Work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Hmm. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. Okay, so they can do this. This is something that they are capable of doing. And I am sure that we have people in the world today that can make a rope into a snake. Remember, you used to, as a matter of fact, I know they can. You know, you, you got a rope and all of a sudden it becomes a snake. And how they do that, you know, the snake goes somewhere. And it, it, Well, you know what I'm saying is that you have a staff and then it becomes a snake. And I, it, this is just an example of how we can do things that are so tricky that people don't know. I, there's this one guy that does these very, very bizarre magic tricks. And I've seen him a couple times on TV. And he, I, I think he's probably filled with the devil personally. But one of the things he w did one time, and I, do, I can't imagine how he did it. He had a girl sign her name on a quarter with a Sharpie pen or something. Okay, He swallowed the quarter. You could see him put it in his mouth. You know, maybe he had it in his hand. You know, I don't know. But anyway... Then he started doing this and, he, you know, doing this with his body. And then he starts pushing. And he's pushing. And the quarter comes out under his skin. You can see this round thing. No. And then somebody took a knife and cut his skin, pulled out the quarter, and it had her signature on it. Now, how he did that, I have no idea. But you see what I'm saying? It is people can do very unusual things. And this guy did some things that were, I think, even more bizarre than that. Like, he'd end up, he'd be standing here, they'd put him in a box on a street in the middle of a, 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 a block on the neighborhood. And, you know, they'd have the, the thing all locked up. You see this on stage where they have false bottoms and stuff, but this is on the asphalt right there. They put the thing down, there's no, uh, uh, what do you call it, a uh, sewer hole or anything. Yeah, they just put it down there, and then... They, they wait, or I can't remember what he did, but they open that piece, not there, and he's standing up on top of the building. And this is like 45 seconds later, maybe. It, how did he do it? You know, and he, he can do things. Well, that's, the reason why I'm telling you this is because we can think things up that confuse people. And people say, well, you know, of course they're going to say this is no trick at all. When we can do it, so what is God doing? He's starting with the least, the things that he knows that we can conjure up on ourselves in order to prove how glorious he is because we're going to see with the snake and then with everything it does it gets progressively more impossible 
to the point where the Egyptians say, we can't do this. This really is the finger of God. 